Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Before I start today's show, I wanted to let everyone know watching that a fellow daytime fan and friend passed away over the weekend. My heart and my condolences go out to the family of Jeffrey Martin, sir. Jeffrey has watched day, uh, daytime soaps forever, and he has watched many locker room episodes over the past year, and he always told me to look him up if I made my way to L.A. for a visit. I'm really sad to say that we'll never get the chance to do that, and sad that he's not here to watch this show today because he sent me a message last week that he was so looking forward to it. Again, my heart goes out to his family and friends. Today's guest, Jill Farron Phelps, is an executive producer who has worked on Another World, General Hospital, Guiding Light, One Life to Live, Santa Barbara, and The Young and the Restless. Jill was born in New York City and earned her BFA in directing from Carnegie Mellon University and began her television career in 1974 at Guiding Light. She worked as a casting assistant before becoming a production assistant from 19, a uh, production assistant. From 1977 to 1984, she served as Emmy award-winning music director on General Hospital. In 1984, she joined Santa Barbara, where she rose up in the ranks to become the show's executive producer. Jill has worked as an executive producer at all three television networks, producing six daytime dramas, as well as two primetime dramas on cable television. The first season of SoapNet's primetime General Hospital spinoff, General Hospital Night Shift, and Nick at Night's Hollywood Heights. As an EP, she has been nominated for 15 Daytime Emmy Awards and has won a total of 11, uh, 11 Emmys for her work. Daytime fans are certainly passionate about Phelps' work, the good and the bad over the years. And I'm thrilled that she agreed to sit down with me today to discuss it all. Please welcome to the locker room, Emmy Award winner, Jill Farron Phelps. Did I get it all right? You got it all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm yeah. very sorry for the loss of your friend. Yeah, yeah it, 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 was a, it was a shock really to read. Um, he, he, he loved this <laughs> industry, loved it. Um, speaking of the industry, were you a fan before you ever became, you know, started working in it? Uh, I I was not a fan, but I certainly remember watching when I was homesick from school. I remember watching Tommy Lee Jones on uh, um, One Life to Live. I don't want to date myself, but yes, I uh, um, you know I certainly watched from time to time. But it was I was not uh, a daytime television fan. Right, I became one. Oh, I yeah. I I mean, you would have to to to. Do the work that you did because I mean it is any nor I can't even you know I, I know doing PR was a, a hard task for a show I can't imagine what an executive producer now you went to Carnegie Mellon for um, directing what where did the uh, desire to direct come from or to study directing well I, I love the theater and I couldn't act at all, never could, still can't. So, um, and I was bossy, but I also did um, a lot of sort of high school kind of directing and things like that. And I thought, you know, the opportunity to go to Carnegie and to work in the directing program um, would set me up to be able to be a director later in life. Um, but as I like to say, I had greatness thrust upon me and uh, I never had the opportunity. I did do some directing in New York on talent tests and for Procter and Gamble, but basically I got offered a job as a producer and uh, you know, the rest is history. Interesting. How, how do you think your degree informed your work as an executive producer? Well, I think studying directing um, especially when I was at Carnegie and the, the, the professor taught a lot about visualization. And so you begin to learn the magic of, you know, where your eye goes and what happens if you're not speaking, but you're actually just watching people's behavior. And all of that informed the, the way I thought about the things I watched. 
And then I translated that when I had the opportunity to sit in the back of a control room into the soaps. Interesting. It's incredible. I mean, Carnegie Mellon, Chris Goutman, Tamara Tooney, Ming-Na Wen, Matt Bomer, Judith Light, Renee Elise Goldsberry are some of the you know folks who graduated from that school. Ted Danson. I sat next to Teddy the entire time that we were in, in, uh, in, at Carnegie and Judith I love was that. there. Yeah. What, what's the experience like? Cause I know it's such a, you know, um, uh, renowned school. Well, it's a great school. I mean, you know, basically you're so young when you, when you go there, you're not really sure what's happening, but, uh, they make you work your way up, you know? I mean, as a, as a freshman, you're making costumes, you're sitting backstage, you're, uh, uh, you know, you're working your ass off. And then once I became a, you know, it takes until you're a junior to be able, in directing, to be able to do your first junior project. And then I did my senior project. And, uh, um, you know, I, it, it was great. It, it was just great. It was hard. And, you know, half the time I didn't know what I was doing, but boy, did I meet a lot of talented people. And I to see. this day, when I would be auditioning kids or, or grownups or whomever, as I did the soaps, the, the actors and actresses that came in from Carnegie, like Yale and Juilliard, I mean, they were just extraordinary. They just were a wonderfully, yes, absolutely. That, that, that's amazing. And, and your first job out of college was working on Pippin with the legendary Bob Fosse. What do you recall about working with him? Well, it was, you know, I mean, I always say that I was too young to appreciate what an extraordinary opportunity that was for me. Mm -hmm. um, although I certainly know now. I mean, I was basically when um, uh, I was raised in the musical theater. My uncle was a composer. Um, and he wrote Fiddler on the Roof and a bunch of other rather well-known musicals. And for my senior project, I did The Apple Tree. And my uncle who had written it came down, my aunt and uncle and my parents came down to watch it and uh, they loved it. And so my uncle went back and spoke to the producer of Pippin, whose name was Stuart Ostrow, um, whom I had grown up with and who sent me a note and said, I'm about to do a show, would you like to be, uh, you know, basically, Fosse's assistant, which he said means, you know, you take his notes and you go for coffee. And I said, you know, I was 22 years old. I said, um, okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I came in there not really knowing what an unbelievable experience yeah. it was going to turn out to be. And I watched, I mean, Stephen Schwartz, who wrote yeah. uh, Pippin, also went to Carnegie. And I watched them basically craft a show in the process of being on the road, we were at, uh, um, uh, I guess they all stayed at the Watergate. I was at the Howard Johnson's and it was at the Kennedy Center where we, where we started. Um, and it was amazing and he was amazing. And, and that was the year that he won the Tony, the Oscar and the Emmy. And so that really helped me as a production assistant get work. Because if I said, I work for Bob Fosse, they'd be like, wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I bet. That's a good thing it, to it have on good. your resume. It was very good at the time. And he was a genius, you know, odd, uh, eccentric, and a genius. Did you watch Fosse on FX when it aired? Oh, sure. Oh, Did sure. And one of the episodes, I don't remember which one, but one of them was so accurate to my recollection of what had happened that it was uncanny. Wow. I mean, it was like, I was there when that happened. <laughs> so, that, you know, that, I mean, yeah, that's definitely got to be weird seeing something like that and then realizing, wow, how'd they know that? Yeah. They, crazy. They knew. Yeah, it was great. A and then your first job in daytime was at casting assistant at Guiding Light. Um, was that with Betty Ray? It sure was the remarkable, legendary, magnificent Betty Ray. Yes, yes. it wow. was, it was. And from there I, I became a production assistant. Right, um, now was, was there just an opening or was casting something you were interested in? How did that? Well, I was, I was gonna get married in that same period of time and it was after Pippin. 
And I remember not wanting to be um, a gypsy. I didn't want to go from place to place to place because I was about to settle down. And I lived in New York. And so I just started making the rounds of the soaps. And uh, there was an opening at, uh, um, at Guiding Light. And so that's how I started there. They gave me the job. Wow. And, uh, and then I was fortunate enough to be promoted to, uh, um, to the production assistant. Are there any actors you remember uh, walking through the door there for, for casting when you were at the early before becoming an EP? I have to say no. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a very, very long time ago. Right. No, a lot of actors. Um, no, but, you know, I certainly remember the actors that were there, but I right. don't remember any that, that we auditioned. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think from there you ended up uh, at General Hospital in, as a music director and sent, right. spent six years doing that. How did you go into music? Well, as I say, I was very interested in music as I was growing up. But also, um, when I was production assistant on Guiding Light a hundred years ago, everybody, <laughs> the music people, the sound effects people, obviously the director and the associate director and the technical director and maybe even the lighting director, everyone was in the same control room. Um, as time went on, everybody got their own little booths with their own little windows. But at that time, everyone was in the, was in the control room. And the music um, composer was Charles Paul who had written a ton of music for all of the soaps. And he was in the control room and he would play his cues and I would hear the cues. And because I always have been a bit of a smart ass, I would sing along with the cues. <laughs> so I would get, um, I mean, at that time, I was the youngest person in the control room. And, uh, um, and so I loved Charlie and, uh, you know, the, it, was, it became a funny thing, you know? I mean, that, uh, that when he played a cue, I'd sing along. So, I got married, we moved to California, and I got a call from Charlie, Charles Paul, that he had been offered the opportunity to do the music for General Hospital. And did I want to come in and be the music director? And, uh, you know, I was, again, still young, and I thought, well, yeah, I, that sounds like a great thing. And so I started as the music director. I shared the job with another composer whose name was Dominic Messenger. Um, and we shared the job. And so since I had Courtney, my daughter, during that very early period of time, I would work um, Thursday, Friday, then I'd be off Saturday, Sunday, then I'd work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I'd have seven days off. Oh, so wow. I stayed because I was able to work on something that I really liked. And at the same time, I was able to raise my daughter and uh, um, and you know, be a, be a mother who was actually present, which was very important to me. Hmm. Um, it must have been almost a dream job if music was such a big part of your life. It was a great job. I mean, you know, it was also an incredible experience to work for Gloria Monty, um, who was not easy, who would sometimes call me on the phone and say to me, what do you think you're doing, guiding light? <laughs> I mean, there was no question that it was there was a lot to learn from her, um, but it also, we did a lot of music in those days. And I've, to this day, I'm not sure if I made up this rule, but you could use music um, that was popular or that was on the radio or that had been, you know, uh, a hit on the soaps. Um, I was always told that you could do it, you know, one time only. Years later, I learned that that was never supposed to be okay, but that's what we did on General Hospital. And that's how Rise was found for the, for the Luke and Laura rape and Baby Come to Me and some of the songs that were really big hits during that period of time, and it certainly was the golden years when I was there, were very well-known pieces of music. And that was very exciting. I have a gold record from Quincy Jones for, for the song that James Ingram uh, and Patty Austin did Baby Come to Me, which was a, you know, which sold a million copies after. That's which, amazing. You know. I love that you thought you were allowed and you just <laughs> did it. Well, that, uh, you know, that's the in, best way to do it. <laughs> in in my day, um, in at that point, there weren't people who were micromanaging the way they were. You know, the soaps were kind of something that were off in the in the abyss, and 
And if music broke on a soap, it was a very good thing for that particular piece of music or those composers. So, you know, everybody benefited. And, uh, um, and so, you know, that was why it was an exciting time. And yeah. I don't know if I made it up or not, but later they found out, no, you can't have that. That costs money. You can't have it for free. Oh, yeah. Music be became such a moneymaker. Um, and then you left GH to go to Santa Barbara in music, right? And then yes. th that's where you first became an executive producer? Yes. A and, and how did that happen? <laughs> well, w w was it... Was it different doing music there than General Hospital, or relatively the, the same? The, no, it was complete. It was completely different. It was also, you know, going to part of why I got the job is because I had come from General Hospital, having you know learned at the side of Gloria Monti when she, you know, w which was pretty pretty great. And uh, um, when I went to Santa Barbara, they had made the decision that they were not going to do it like a regular daytime show. They were going to do it like a primetime show. And so what they did basically was surround themselves with all kinds of, you know, very talented people from primetime who didn't know anything about how you do a soap opera. And so we were going until four o'clock in the morning and the, it was like the music was like, whatever, you know, I mean, they had so many problems and I'm talking about in the very early days mm. and so that you know I got, I got to know the network executives and you know I'm occasionally one of them would come in and say to me what would you do in this time you know and and it wasn't about music and uh because I'd had some experience um you know watching and learning on another soap opera and so that's how uh, the music from Santa, uh, that's how I got the offer to become a producer, which is what I started out to be on Santa Barbara. And then working your way up to an executive producer. How does yes. that, how does that magic happen? Well, it was, uh, um, it was a very tumultuous time at Santa Barbara, which I think is pretty well known. There were lawsuits and, you know, I mean, all kinds of drama behind the scenes. Um, there was a time when the wonderful Mary Ellis Bunham came in and she was the executive producer. And then Bridget and Jerry Dobson, who were the executive producers, were no longer there. And so when Mary Ellis left, they said, well, let's see. By then I was a supervising producer and they knew enough about my work that when everything sort of went to, to hell and it was very litigious, they gave me the job. And uh, that was an unbelievable experience because there was so much chaos in the background that nobody paid any attention to us. <laughs> and we had an opportunity to come together and create something that was unusual and special and memorable. So you were and, like on a 50 foot diving board, just diving into the taken off. Was, that's right. Was, is there someone uh, at Santa Barbara that you credit sort of with taking you under their wing and helping you there? Or did you really just take it all in and? Well, I was there for a few years um, as, you know, as a producer and worked my way up. And so there were a lot of really smart people that were around. And then there were a lot of people who didn't know how to do daytime who, you know, once they found out how really hard it was, they left. So uh, um, I think I learned on the job. Um, you know, I was also partnered with some, you know, terrific writers. And, uh, you know, we just, we made some, you know, we decided to do whatever we wanted to do. And that was pretty, uh, pretty great. Um, and we were the first show, though we could not get our ratings up. Um, I learned later in life how you might do that. But we were demographically very successful. And so demographics became something that was important to the networks. And that's part of what I think kept Santa Barbara alive for her, as long as it did. Oh, interesting. And you put Eden and Cruz together, didn't you? Well, I did. I, I, I mean, the writers put Eden and <laughs> Cruz in, in the same room together. And what I did was see that there was something so electric 
between these two actors, their intention, the writer's intention, I don't think was to put them together. But when you were sitting in the control room and you were watching A. Martinez and Marcy Walker interact in the most casual of ways, there was something really special about it. So I took them out into the hallway and I said, listen, I don't know what you're doing, but do it. Keep doing it. M make sure that you look across the room at each other like you love each other and I'll make sure we shoot it. And so that's kind of how that evolved. And uh, um, that was a pretty, that was an amazing pairing. And yeah, I mean, they, they, I, I didn't watch Santa Barbara, but I know the magic too that young. was. Everybody, you know, anybody who hears those two names together knows that that was a magical pairing. Right. Well, that's two uh, phenomenal actors who had the kind of chemistry that is really rare and, uh, um, and who understood what it meant to, okay, let's do this, you know, let's get this. And everybody was on board. Um, and I was such a young producer that I remember being in a meeting at the Dobson's uh, house and Brian Franz was the network executive. And oh, I wow. was, I was hemming and hawing and trying to figure out, you know, whether I should say it or not say it or what, you know, you get braver as you do it longer. And, uh, um, and I remember Brian just sort of confronting me and saying to me, are you saying that we should make Cruz and Eden a couple? <laughs> and my, you know, I just went, yes, I am. And then I thought, well, I'll hope for the best, but it sure was a good decision. Well, definitely. What, what are some other highlights from your time there? Oh, there were, um, you know, it was so much fun because it was, um, it was just a bunch of kids doing what we thought was good. And of course you learn as you do, you know, as you watch how other people do all kinds of television, and films and things like that. When you have freedom, you can be more creative. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, one of my favorite things that Chuck Pratt ever wrote was we had the oldest living hitman who was played by Abe Vigoda, who, oh, was, trying to, who was trying to kill somebody. So for a week, we Finish. had, we had, right, we had Abe Vigoda in the trees outside somebody's house, I don't remember who, with a big gun and by the end of the week, the tree branch had broken and he fell on the ground. So, you know, we did sort of wild things like that. And uh, of course we had Justin Dees and Robin Matson and Robin Wright. I mean, there was yeah. just a, you know, I mean, it was amazing and talented directors and talented writers. And, and with all the chaos and all the rest of it, we were, you know, we were able to, um, we were able to succeed. So. Wow. And then Eden's rape was a huge story that you, you had Emmy wins for writing show and Marcy Walker. What, what do you remember about that? Well, one of the things that has been both a good thing about me and a bad thing about me is, <laughs> is that I really, um, I think it's really important to do high stakes drama. I, uh, as much as, you know, I get a rap for not wanting to do enough people eating around the table, I it, that's not entirely true, but it is true that I think that it's important to have high stakes. I would that, never... That high stakes drives tune in. That's exactly right. And that's what gets rating. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I would never do that today. Never. Because Eden was raped by her gynecologist. Uh, then, you know, some of the things but, that we but did. But that is so relevant today because all of those Olympic young women. Right. It's relevant. It's just, it's not something you necessarily, it's like guns, you know, like right. the guns we had on, on General Hospital. You know, I mean, as the times change, we change with them and things that seemed like they were acceptable at one time are no longer acceptable. However, the stakes of that story were so high, the amount, the emotional, um, what's the word? Just, just the, just the stakes were so high. I mean, Eden was raped, and uh, you know, Cruz was insane, and the wonderful Lee McCluskey played the gynecologist. 
Um, and we got a lot right. of is he from, serious Is he from problems. Dallas? Why, why do I know his name? That he's from Dallas, Dallas. And he went on, I think it was Dallas. Yeah. Um, he's a wonderful guy. And, uh, and I actually brought him to One Life to Live for, um, for a minute, um, making him an FOJ. But um, <laughs> always, always a bad thing. Uh, but anyway, I just think the fact that, that it mattered so much in the lives of these people what had happened and it shook everything up so much that it gave the actors an opportunity to act and gave Marcy an opportunity to win an Emmy and the writers were brilliant and uh, it was a fearless story. We did an entire episode during that time with no dialogue. Uh, wow. Bob, yeah, Bob Guza wrote it. It was a an story hour, about- the, An hour show with no dialogue. Yeah, it was about the death. I forgot that. I actually just remembered it. So if someone wants to say, no, you didn't. No, we really <laughs> did. Um, wow. And uh, and it was about the death of, of you know, um, the, the rape and the death of a child, I think, or something. But it was just letting the actors. I mean, the 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 hour was written, but the, there was they didn't speak. So we had the opportunity to do things like that on Santa Barbara. Wow. Can, can you talk about some of the casting decisions, not just at Santa Barbara, everywhere that you've made um, th that you're just really proud of some of those casting choices? Well, there were so many, so I'm going to probably um, You'll, yes, leave, forgive us leave for leaving a bunch some of out. people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, Cynthia Watros was in under five on Guiding Light. And uh, we decided, well, she's interesting. And so we cast her. Thank Wendy you very Mo much for doing that. Right. Wendy Moniz oh. as Diana. Um, Dinah. Uh, Dinah, right. Dinah. Yeah. Um, oh, well, my God. Those, Liz, those two alone speak volumes. <laughs> I know. But when Sherry Stringfield, who is on Guiding Light, came to me, there's a couple times in my career where people have come to me and said, I want to leave. And it's like, no, you can't. <laughs> Um, but she really did. And of course she went on to be a, uh, you know, a primetime, um, success, but we cast, um, Liz Kiefer to replace her, which was a pretty, uh, Phenomenal a, pr replacement. a pretty re good replacement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, um, Ron Raines, I brought in Ron Raines. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it really, it, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to Beverly. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, those are. It, it's very hard, like Chris Bruno to replace. You know, right? I mean, look, very it, hard. Very hard. Very hard. And Ron I mean, made Alan his own. Yeah. You know. Yeah, he sure did. He sure did. I mean, you just you get lucky sometimes. You know, I mean, you. One of my one of one of the. Two of my favorite stories in General Hospital were um, when we were, I don't even remember, we were casting a doctor on General Hospital and it was a very important role. And the first person who read for me was Jason Thompson. Mm -hmm. And Jason Thompson did one of the best auditions that I have ever seen anybody do in Mark Teschner's office sitting with me. And I remember when he was finished and he was the first, the first guy to audition of 300 that were coming in um and i just said to him wow that was a kick-ass audition <laughs> we we went in and we saw the rest of the group and jason got the role and my other favorite one is trying to find a son for sunny which was probably one of the most challenging roles that we had to cast because he was going to be working with maurice bernard who you know was going to have an opinion about it. And it was a critical character. And we were having a lot of trouble finding somebody to do it. And I got a, uh, um, I got a tape uh, from Canada, from an actor in Canada whose name was Dominic Zampronia. And I looked at the tape and I thought, you know, people didn't do it that way anymore in those days. And I just looked at the tape and I thought, there's something about him. I think we should bring him in and let's look at him. And we did, and we cast him. And I think it was one of the best decisions 
uh, that I've ever made. And isn't he still playing casting. the character? Absolutely. He's, yeah. He's come and gone, but he was just nominated for an Emmy. And, wow. uh, um, you know, I, I, he's just, he was a wonderful choice. And he and Maurice were very, very special together. I mean, mm. there, there were lots. Robin Christopher, um, you know, bringing her into one life. Mark Derwin. You know, uh, lots, well, lots and lots and lots. Mark's fantastic. Um, and and Brian Buffington, little Bill Lewis just mm -hmm. texted and says hello to you. I can't <laughs> believe he's a father. You know, oh, I follow I know. people on Facebook and it's like, <laughs> you can't be that grown up. It, it, uh, he really, hi, Brian. <laughs> he really is. So I read an interview you did with Michael Logan a few years ago where you stated you've done more soaps than most people in the business and that you've broken a lot of so-called rules over the years that resulted in some very public misfires. Can you talk about what you think are some of the biggest misfires? Well, I think, I'm sure I said misfires. I certainly think I made... A, a very colossal um, mistake that I learned from that I have been paying the price for in some <laughs> fashion for the rest of my career. And that was um, what I did with uh, Ellen Parker, um, with Maureen Bauer, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's really important for me to start by saying um, it was not personal. It was not personal. When I came to Guiding Light, um, it, all of the major A player stars were gone. Reva and Josh and Beth and I mean, all of them had left um, because in those days people did that on the soaps. They left, they did other things and then they came back. But what was left was this unbelievable group of actors who, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps were classified as the B team, but were in fact you know, Maeve Kincaid and, and Peter Simon and, I mean, Jay and all these guys that were Tina, um, amazing actors. And so I just wanted to do something that would completely reset what I thought at the time was a slightly tired show. And also money was always important. And so one of the ways you save money on a soap opera is to not change the sets around. So we decided that we were going to, I promise I'll get to what yeah, happened. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, but we decided that we were gonna try to put up the same sets for an entire week and do a blackout, which, uh, um, which would essentially freeze people in various places. Uh, at the time, the writers um, that wrote this, what I consider to be the most brilliant uh, week of television that I was ever associated with were um, Stephen Demarest and Jim Riley and Lorraine Broderick. Oh, I'm glad um, you mentioned that. Stephen and Nancy are going to be on next week. Stephen and Nancy, I was going to tell you, and Jim Riley were my were the my most favorite writers. Remember, Guiding Light was just my second show, and so I came from Guiding Light. I came from Santa Barbara with all of the, you know, the way we did it then and walked into this place and met these three people. And, you know, we had a nice talk and, you know, I, and they told me what they liked. And I said, well, I'll do my best not to mess it up though. That's not the word I used. And uh, <laughs> but what happened with them that was so unbelievable was that when I started getting the breakdowns and the things that they were writing, I was like, I don't have any notes. I couldn't do this any better. I couldn't, think of any of the things that those incredibly creative writers were doing. And so that made my job a lot easier and perhaps yeah. gave me more time to think about ways that I could, you know, rearrange it. And especially when you can speak to writers who so understand that and who then laid out this map. And it was very, very carefully planned. I mean, Lillian's Breast cancer was designed to make her vulnerable enough and in a relationship of some kind with Ed Bauer. I'm going to forget a lot of people's names, not the actors' names, but the characters' names. That's okay. And, uh, um, you know, Sherry Stringfield was leaving and Jerry Verdor, and it was going to cheat on Holly with, you know, whatever. And so yeah. we ended up with, with uh, um, Liz Kiefer Lit being the woman. And 
and Roger and, and Maureen had a, you know, were caught together and Michelle and Fiona uh, were yeah. in the- um, Fiona, and, yeah. yeah. Right. So we did so many things to take the show and turn it on its ear and to rearrange the things that were happen happening. And I did, I told you that last night I watched uh, the episode of the show that you did with Ellen Parker and Maeve. Oh, I love you, Maeve. And, uh, um, and Tina and little Michelle. And, uh, <laughs> not um, so little anymore. Not so little anymore. No. But, um, but you know, as I was watching it, I realized the uh, the depth of the feeling that these actors have for each other and it is true i mean ellen told the story about something about a research i mean you know one of the things that is really hard about being an executive producer is having to fire people and i think i it's, was just i, I would assume it's one of the hardest job parts of the it, job it absolutely is one of the hardest parts and i think that with ellen um, I know she, I think she thought I sort of blew it off. I think I was just a coward and that's why I called her. And, and uh, she said, you know, well, I mean, I, I've gotten considerably better at it over the years. Not that it's ever easy, but, um, but again, the reality, you your second show is an EP. It's, right. Right. That, 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 that isn't something that comes natural to any of us to fire people. No. And, and there were people, not actors, but there were people that needed to be fired on Guiding Light when I got there because the show was stale and it needed to be judged up. So um, anyway, um, we told this story because we did have a focus group as Ellen had mentioned last night, or I saw it last night, mm -hmm. um, but we didn't, you know, it wasn't quite, we were really researching what we could do, what character we could lose. Now, today, I will tell you, it was a terrible mistake. But the thing that made it an even worse mistake was that in the course of telling the story that we told with all of the various wonderful things about it, we let Ellen loose, Ellen, we let Maureen Bauer loose to, so that, Ellen Parker had an opportunity to show what a brilliant actress she was, is, was, and we made the audience care about her. And if I ever had to give advice to anybody, and I certainly have over the years, don't ever kill a character that you make the audience care about. We thought we were taking, you know, yes, the matriarch, yes, this was not about Ellen, this was about we needed to do something that would just explode the canvas. Um, so that's the biggest misfire. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't know then because there wasn't an internet the way there became uh, an internet that, that it was as, um, as upsetting and as horrible for the audience as I later learned. Mm -hmm. I mean, my regret was she won an Emmy and she's a lovely lady and a wonderful actress. And it's terrible to have to let anybody go. Um, but I'm not making an excuse for it. I'm simply saying the reason that we did it, our, our, you know, our drama heads were in the right place. Um, when years later, when I was on General Hospital, I think this is one of the things we talked about, my assistant, Nika, Mm -hmm. called me from uh, her, uh, said to me from her office, did you know you won one of the 10 stupidest things that anyone's ever done in daytime? This was years later. And I said, I did. And she <laughs> said, yeah. And so I, you know, then there was, a, then there was the beginning of social media. I mean, serious social media. And so I came in and I looked at it and, and whoever this guy who wrote it, I remember him, but I'm not going to say his name. Um, definitely hated me and definitely thought this was the stupidest thing that anyone had ever done. That's when I really began to look at what I did. That's when I began to look at the price that the audience paid for my decision to make something dramatic. Um, it is so interesting that you say that because you would, you would have known it instantly today. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and by the and time a fan writes in, I'm sure they called, but that's a whole different, you know, how that's monitored or, or whatever. But today we all know how anybody feels instantly. Right. Right. Which is why it was it was important for me to really look at what I did because um, or what we had done. I didn't just do it by my all by myself. I didn't, you know, I didn't say, well, Alan Parker did. Um, It wasn't personal. It was part of a really dramatic story that we told. And uh, um, and I'm very proud of that story. But I I mean, that whole all of that story and that whole blackout were incredible story. Incredible story. And well, gave everybody, I mean, across the canvas, work. That right. if, per se, you don't know, if Reva and Josh and Philip and Beth were there, those people might have been still in the back burner. Right, exactly. And that was the challenge that I had because I could see that there were a lot of really talented people, actors on this show, that had been on for years and were very, very wonderful, but they just weren't carrying the show, and now they needed to. And so in order to shake it up and make those people move forward on the bench, we told that story. So, you know, but, but as each, with each show, you learn, you know, you learn. And what happened after that was that I realized that the internet was not a friendly place for me to be. Mm-hmm. Because truthfully, after the Maureen Bauer death, I mean, you know, I've had a wonderful career and I've been very, very lucky and I've had a chance to be extremely creative but I have been told by many people in social media that I have killed every actor that has ever been taken off of Mm. a soap opera. I did not kill Frankie Frame. I mean, you know, it's so silly to say that. It's like, who cares? But no, I didn't. But but the fans do. uh, And and that was not your, right. I mean, there's so many uh, misconceptions about people, you know, what people, in daytime have done or contributed to a show. And that's something you didn't contribute to. That's right. The Frankie Frame. That's right. I was on my way out. So, it, you know, it was, that was, that was shit, strictly writers. How did um, that letter that your assistant read, read to you um, sort of, you know, enlighten you to, as you moved forward from that point? Well, it was an opportunity for me to reflect. I thought the guy that wrote it was a jerk and mean and whatever. And that was my first reaction. My second reaction was, well, let's really, is that what they thought? And then as um, social media, I mean, I knew people were mad at me because they loved Alan Parker, um, but I didn't realize the level of, grief that it had caused so many of the people that were watching it. And I got to see what my part in that was, not just by letting her go, but by making you care about her as much as you did. And that's when you- you Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing though about the um, depth of the grief. And I I don't think there's a a right answer, but it's sort of um, because of the nature of daytime and everybody moves around to, you know, it's not like you were the executive producer of Guiding Light for 70 years, right? you know, cause you might know that, but because of the nature, it's impossible to know everything or the impact every decision will make. And right. as, a, as an EP, you're making hundreds of decisions a day. Right, right. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's crazy. Can you talk about Beverly McKinsey and her, you know? Well, it was, you know, I mean, it's hard to talk about it because the way it happened was so bizarre. I mean, I liked Beverly. Um, I thought she was a wonderful actress. I thought she liked me. I hadn't Mm -hmm. been on the show for very long. Um, And I was on vacation. And I got a phone call in the hotel from somebody. And I remember thinking, there better be a fire in the building for you to call me and Alex uh, while I'm on vacation. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whom I love, love, love to this day. Um, and she said, Beverly left. And I was like, what? And she said, Beverly left. And I said, well, that's not possible. But it was. I mean, Beverly had some clause in her contract 
that said that after she took, you know, 12 weeks of vacation, many of which had happened when I wasn't there, um, and I didn't know. It, it never even occurred to me, should we look up and see if an actor could walk off the set if they wanted to? Um, she clearly it, was- It, it never happened before, and it has not happened after. <laughs> never, never. And, and while they were telling me, she was cleaning out her dressing room. So by the time I got back, she was gone. Wow. She was gone. I mean, so, what does that do? For, you know, just what does that do for a show and for for you? It throws you into, you know. Well, some things are a baptism by fire. You know, some things that happen like that really force you to learn something you never hoped you'd have to learn. And that was you better get somebody really, really good. Mm. <laughs> and you better plug them into story at a time when they can't look away. I mean, that's something I've done many times in the course of my career when actors have left, that you, the way to get a recast to work is to make sure that it's about the story and not about the actor. And so I don't remember whether I had time to do that with Beverly, but I do know we were very lucky to get Marge to say. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you get it, when, when a powerhouse like Beverly leaves, you need another powerhouse. And there isn't always one around. So, you know. <laughs> They're not we just waiting lucky. in the wings. They're not. <laughs> They're usually working. Yeah, true, true, true. Um, you've talked about some of the people you've recast, but uh, is there one that you would really say was the toughest, that you just had the hardest time finding or, or, or wanting to make sure that it was absolutely correct? And it may be Marge or, you know, whoever. Well, that was just, as I say, that was like being shot out of a cannon. <laughs> I mean, there, there was no time to try to strategize that. Um, you right. Know, they, my, the casting director couldn't give you like 10 people to choose from. Like you, right. you, you had to right. go. Yeah. I mean, and she was gone. I mean, she left. So there was, uh, I mean, it was just a, it, it was, you know, then it was just a catastrophe. Today, I think it's like wild that that was actually able to happen. Um, oh, but we, you know. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And, that does not, you, you, you were, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, um, Farrah Fawcett leaving Charlie's Angels after the first right. season. You know, right. Like, and they made her right. come back for, you know, three episodes for the next three years. But like those things there, don't happen in, in yeah. big shows. And there was no making Beverly come back, you know. <laughs> I mean, she left, her dressing room was cleaned out, and I was on vacation. So she, she uh, chimed all in. All of our guiding lighters are talking about why P, I think, was cleaning out her dressing room where he found it empty. Oh, um, yes. Y P, who worked, you know, who cleaned the guiding light, um, the maintenance guy, I think, Y P. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it was actually, I think she only told one other actor, and that actor was helping her, whom I liked very much, and, and, uh, um, and he helped her clean out her, you know, her dressing room. And he's, the, that's the brain I tried to pick about, why'd she do this? Why'd she do this? But people that knew her knew why she did it. So, yeah. you know, I just had a show I had to continue to put on. 100%. Um, and that's not easy when you have story written. No, that's not easy. But, you know, I mean, as for recast, they're never easy. Sh again, Sherry Stringfield to Liz Kiefer was important. Um, when when Lane Davies wanted to leave Santa Barbara as Mason, that was, I mean, we just didn't think we were going to be able to do that. Um, and uh, what we did was we recast him with Terry Lester. But the way we did it was, again, on a Friday, um, we punched Lane Davies in the face. I don't remember who did it. I don't remember <laughs> what was going on. But on Monday, Terry Lester stood up. So they were so involved in whatever the story was at that time that caused him to go, you know, that caused Mason to get punched in the face that they had to keep watching no matter how mad they were when Terry Lester stood up. So that's, I think, the key to successful recasting. Recast. We did, this, did the same thing with Sarah Brown and Tamara Braun. 
Um, I don't remember what we did, but I know we right. did that. Too. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you've got great story, they're going to keep tuning in. Yeah, I mean, right. you can't you can't do a recast and then put them on the back burner. No one's going to care about them. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And so. when you came to Another World, Anna Holbrook and Jensen Buchanan were both on maternity leave. How difficult is that for you? When you know, to, you know, what 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 did you do to drive story um, at that time? Well, that. You know, Another World was a, a place where I met some of my closest friends. Um, and like Guiding Light, I, I walked into Another World a little cockier than I was now. It was my third show. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and Anna Holbrook and Jensen Buchanan, two women whom I adore, were both gone on maternity leave. And that left a, a couple of really hot guys walking around. And when I asked, well, why is, why did Anna Holbrook leave? What was her, oh, uh, what was her character's name? A fan will tell us, I, I can't remember. Okay, yeah, I, I will remember, uh, but I can't remember. And, uh, um, and they said, well, she wanted to find herself. And I said, what? Charlene, was that her name? Charlene, I think yeah, it was. Charlene okay. Frame. Yeah. Right, okay, so, um, I did not understand the concept, and this is one of the things that I thought soap operas just didn't think about, which is when a woman says to her husband, I need to leave, really I'm on maternity leave, but I'm gonna tell you and the audience that I'm going to find myself, and he says, okay, it just doesn't ring true. So it offered the opportunity for me to use David Forsyth and Linda Dano in a romance that was completely, you know, it was like Tina and Ed, yeah. uh, Peter on Guiding Light. It was, no, it shouldn't happen. This shouldn't happen. But the fact that it happened made people care. And the fact that, um, you know, when, Sh when Charlene came back and John was having a relationship with Linda or she found out about it, she ended up with John's brother, who was played by Cale Brown. So it was a total, it was like the blackout week only it took a year of, you know, mixing things up and trying to take advantage of the fact that we uh, didn't have two really major players, but also saying to the audience, when a woman says she's going to go find herself for six months and the husband is okay with that, something isn't ringing true. Doesn't mean he has to have an affair, but he needs to have a reaction. So I had a very good time on, on Another World and was, um, the ratings were very successful over the year that I was there um, until somebody killed Frankie Frame. Um, <laughs> but I, that was literally as I was leaving. Um, and I, I really felt that that was a very good year for me. Not everyone um, that's now on social media agrees with that. But I really felt like we were telling a lot of heart and soul story with a lot of really good actors, Matt Crane and Robin Christopher and John Bolger, who came in. And, uh, and I love John Bolger. I know. Me too. Me too. One of my dogs is named Johnny after him. Oh, get so, out. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I love him very much. I mean, I, you know, as much as I love Grant, I thought John was a great Philip. He was. He was. I wasn't there then, but he was. He, John he, is just this soul a, of John. He's a great actor and he's a great, he's a great human actor. being and yes, a great human being. And Linda's still one of your very dear friends, right? One of my very, very dear friends. I mean, I remember her saying to me in the wardrobe room, I think that when they were, when God was making plans for people, you and I were in the same line. I'll never <laughs> forget that she said that to me. Um, and yeah, we were, we were good friends and, and David and I are still very good friends. A Martinez is one of my closest friends uh, that's to awesome. this day, uh, as is Bulger, you know, um, and, you know, I took a lot of heat for bringing those people with me as I went from show to show, but, you know, nobody yelled at, uh, Shonda Rhimes or, you know, Stephen Bochco or any right. of those people. You absolutely, it is so good to be able to bring people whose work you can depend on with you when you have to tackle a new show. But, you know, it, it became something that people felt I was doing to show favoritism.
Right, but that happens, you know, at Google, at Apple, at Microsoft. If there's All good people, the time. if there's an executive who leaves. Speaking of that, that's a perfect segue into Mary O'Leary, who mm. you've met on Guiding Light, and who worked Mary with you on every show. Mary O'Leary was is was uh, the the uh, writer's assistant or the continuity person, or she had a job in that area, basically in the office. And as I was learning the show, Guiding Light, which was a very old show, even though I'd been there as a PA a million years ago, it was, um, there, were, there was a lot to know. <laughs> and Mary was such a ridiculous font of information that it was amazing. And one thing I was not good at in those days were the details of all of these people that I had to learn because I hadn't had time to watch the shows for a million years and get to know them. And Mary was so important to me uh, about that. And so as a result, when I left Guiding Light, um, I brought Mary to another world to be the producer on that. And then when I left another world, I went to One Life to Live and I brought Mary with me to do that. And then when we went to General Hospital, and Young and the Restless. So she was with me for the rest that's, of the uh, That's amazing. Show. But that's, I mean, you know, when you get a job as an executive producer, they don't give you like, hey, here's a month, learn the show. You're right. like, you're in. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know if you could really uh, put into words what the, what the hardest part of being an executive producer is. Other than firing people? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that's... For me, I'm not sure that everybody would say this, um, but for me, I had a conceit that daytime was a, or could be a much more sophisticated or um, not theatrical, but just, just a, a, it could be better. It could be elevated. It could be you know, there were just things about daytime that people weren't watching with gusto because, yes, they loved, you know, the baby showers and the weddings and and all of that was, you know, incredibly important. But again, the stakes of the shows uh, were very important to me. So those misfires were sometimes me just shaking things up and changing things around to try to make people have to watch more. Mm -hmm. So that, that that wasn't just sitting down with the same people. And for some, you know, in some situations that really did help the ratings. But um, again, as the, uh, as the um, social media people and the bands started to get, you know, more vocal about what they thought, any change was threatening to them or they didn't like it and so they didn't really get what the what it was about and why it was happening. Totally threatened, and and you know the, it's scare because uh, you know they get scared when they hear somebody news coming in and what they might do to their show because right. it is you know it is their family. I mean you know you've put some incredible people together. I mean just a random pairing of Erica Slezak and Mark Derwin. Like that's such a that's a great story. How did that's that? A, well, and you, you knew know, Mark from Guiding Light, I assume. I did. And that was another person like Sherry Stringfield who came to me one day and said, we're moving to California. And I was like, no, Guiding Light was in New York. I said, no, you can't move. So that was another one. I don't think, I don't remember if we replaced Mallet, but Not, uh, I don't um, think, I don't think we there. could. I think many yeah. years later. Yeah, he was just, Mark is one of a kind. Also someone who, with whom I'm still a really good friends. Um, it was, we wanted to do something because Clint was no longer on the, on one, one life to live. So there was no more Clinton and Vicky. Um, and so we wanted to bring in another man uh, for Vicky and, and we weren't set on it being a younger man for Erica. Um, another person that I love. Um, and uh, we just, we just knew we needed to find something that was going to be special for her. That wasn't going to be just like, you know, an, an old pair of slippers. And so Mark was in town. 
Um, he called me. Uh, he was going to go be on another show. And I just said to him, would you, would you come over and, and see me before you sign another contract? Uh -huh. And he did. And when he came in, I said, I, I called Angela Shapiro, who was the head of daytime at the time, who was right across the street in her office. And I said, I want to bring somebody over for you to meet. And so literally Mark and I walked across the street to Angela's office and I introduced them to each other and she really liked him, really dug him. We had a great meeting, the three of us. And then when it was over, I said to Mark, okay, go, leave now. So he left and it was Angela and me together. And I said, so what do you think? And he said, she said, let's cast him. And I said, just like that, just cast him. And she said, well, wait a minute. I'm the head of the network and you're the executive producer. <laughs> Who should we ask? <laughs> That's, that is the God's truth. And so I think I went, I, I mean, Mark will remember this better than I do, but I think I walked back to my office with this in mind. And I think he was still out in the street. And I said to him, you got the job, either that or I called him. Um, some of these things I make up, some of them I don't remember, <laughs> but but I do remember that it was quite quick that I let him know. And then the chemistry, you know, I mean, Mark is just, he's just such a doll. And Erica was so game. And so it was just a wonderful pairing. And, and it, it was because I can tell that they they have a great friendship and bond from, from you putting them together. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Well, they're two great people. Mark is a very good partner and, and there's, you know, doesn't get much better than Erica Slezak. Mm, not at, at a lot of levels. And, and we have to talk about Michael Zaslow. You worked with Michael at Guiding Light. He thanked you in his Emmy speech. W what do you remember first about Michael at Guiding Light? And then talk about your decision to bring him to One Life. Um, Michael was, um, I knew Michael when I was a PA, when he was a young guy on Guiding Light. So when I came back as an executive producer, you know, some of them were, you know, ridiculously welcoming and, and people like Michael were like, okay, let's see what you can do. <laughs> um, we ended up having a very nice relationship, but he was, you know, as one of your ladies said last in the show I watched last night. Michael was Michael, you know, he had, he was lovely and warm and wonderful and, you know, tough and uh, uh, not mean, but just, you know, he, uh, Justin Dees was on the show. There's a, there's a piece of casting I was proud of. Um, as oh, Buzz. Yeah, as Buzz. And, and but you cast Justin, him at, one, uh, at Santa Barbara too, didn't you? I, th I, I think he was already there, but okay. I don't remember. But you brought him um, definitely, yeah. I definitely him brought him to Guiding Light. That is, that is a, you know. A, a Where character. he stayed forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, then, and and I think Justin is one of the finest actors that, and I think everybody who worked with him always thought that. But anyway, Justin smoked. And Michael was crazy about the, not in a good way, about the fact that Justin smoked. And people didn't smoke all over each other, you know, and you have to remember it was a very, very, very long time ago. Yeah. So people were not yet, oh, you know, it didn't say smoking will kill you today on the package then. So, but Michael didn't want to be around it. So I remember that he put a red piece of tape on the floor between the stage and the dressing rooms um, to make sure that Justin would never, or anyone that smoked, would ever cross over that red line. So, wow. you know, in those people, people would say, you know, that's why Michael's Michael, but, um, but he was great and, and his work was great. And, uh, um, you know, and, and it was, uh, you know, I have very fond memories of working with him, even though he could be a real pain in the ass sometimes. Mm. Um, he, he, I, I was gone for quite a while before, um, before he got sick or started to get uh, sick. Yeah. And it was actually, um, 
uh, someone in the network who said, how do you feel about bringing him back? And he was bringing him over to One Life. And I mean, you know, of, of course. Um, though we didn't know, he was very ill by then. He was talking on a computer. Um, you know, I mean, he, he, but he was still there. He was, he was still in there. Mm. So, you know, it was joyful to have him come over and tragic and sad to see what that disease is capable of doing and what it was doing to a friend. Yeah. yeah. Awful. Yeah. That disease is the worst. Um, the worst. Yeah. Michael Maloney, I, I told you, he just did an interview with Jeannie Francis where she gave you a shout out um, <laughs> for her 2007 Emmy win because you told her you were submitting her in the supporting character since she had returned only for a limited time. And Jeannie credits you with uh, making the right move. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, Jeannie's, a, Jeannie's as good as it gets. And, uh, um, but you know, sometimes actors, if they let their egos get in the way, they put themselves in the wrong category. Jeannie today, well, today she is in the, uh, in leading actress, but at that time, that was the right place for her to be. And she didn't have an ego about it. She said, okay, if that's what you think. So, uh, um, yeah. Trust is important. Very much so. Yeah. Very, very much so. One of our fans, Candace, was asking, as an EP, and you might have answered this, um, you of many soaps, an EP of many soaps, what is the one thing you regret most? And what is the, the one thing you think you're most proud of? Well, this, I think I've said what I regret most. <laughs> uh, and, but that was a learning experience. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I might have done it differently. It, it, you know, certainly every, any other time that we had, you know, we did the, uh, um, we had to kill a character or let a character go. Uh, I was very careful to make sure the audience didn't care that much about them when it happened. Um, but the, the, I'm proud of a lot of things that we did on, on all the shows. Um, I'm certainly very proud of the Blackout Week um, because it was the beginning of Soap's doing stuff like that, you know? I mean, it was the beginning of taking the form and messing with it. And the um, beginning of so many stories on that show. That's, well, absolutely, that's why. I mean, I you mean, really... That, that's why. I also had, you know, um, Nancy Williams Watt and Patrick Mulcahy and Courtney Simon and Linda Miles. I mean, there were Speaking some of, of the best Simon, writers. Happy birthday, Courtney Simon. Happy birthday, Courtney Simon. <laughs> it's Nancy, oh. and Nancy Williams is watching. And I just said happy birthday to Will Nancy Williams, whom I haven't seen in a long time, but we're friends for life. <laughs> That's great. Um, Hi, Nancy. <laughs> uh, she just put all hearts up for you. Mm. You then uh, went to Young and the Restless. What was your experience like there? Young and the Restless was hard. It was hard. I mean, I had a mandate when I came in to do, um, to bring the show into the 21st century. That was literally what they said to me. And, you know, that's right up my alley. When they say something like that, do they give you an example or just say? Well, if, you, if you watch the show in, you know, in those, in those days, what Bill Bell had done was just the finest writing, storytelling, modeling of how a show should look, be, see, whatever. I think in, his, in soap opera history. Um, but he had been gone for a long time. And what the show had attempted to maintain the pace, the shooting style, the music, and the very thing that I was, that I thought the daytime needed was to model itself a little bit more in a modern way. That, you know, if you watch um, This Is Us, that's a soap opera. In those, in the early, early, early days of, um, and they do a lot of, I mean, it's, it's brilliant, but it's also, 
you know, they take risks. They do things. They make people fall in love and get pregnant and then, you know, back away at the wedding. I mean, that's what needs to happen in order to make things interesting. So I shook some things up. I burned down the, um, you know, the, uh, what was Eric Braden's character's name? Victor, Victor Newman. Newman, God, I'm so <laughs> sorry, all of you young and the rest of the people that are watching. Um, I burned down the Newman Ranch and people hated me for that, but I thought it was just so old and, and old fashioned. And, um, and so I was trying to do what they asked me to do, change the music, made it a little more, you know, um, I, don't, I don't care for wall to wall music on soap operas. Um, I think you have to let actors act. Um, I also learned from watching primetime that you didn't always have to have a music cue at the beginning of the scene and at the end of the scene, that sometimes you could just slam the door and go to black. That was very influential in the way that I, you know, produce shows. And, uh, um, and so I, I certainly did a lot of that on Young and the Restless. Um, but it was a hard, it was hard. I love the people. I mean, they were just uh, such wonderful actors and such, you know, but, but there just needed to be something again to shake it up. And so um, I just encountered a tremendous amount of, um, of network negativity. Um, and, you know, I never ever want to blame Everybody has a job to do. But I, I also felt that everyone's desire, again, to see the baby showers, or, and I'm not against romance, and I'm not, I'm not against baby showers. I'm not against any of that. But the I baby think shower is not going to drive ratings. It's not going to make you have to stay tuned unless there's a bomb under the bassinet. <laughs> right. So, which I used to say to the writers a lot. Um, and, and so, um, we ended up with a story, this is Josh Griffith uh, and I, um, where the character of Delia, Billy's daughter, was hit by a car that was driven by Alan. And so what we did was we took the next generation of Newman and Abbotts and told a story about something that was heart-wrenching Thank God the kid was not as old as Ellen Parker and I, you know, but also I didn't make her somebody who cared about that much, but you certainly cared. And it was not meant to be the brutality of killing a child. It was meant to be something that would take the Abbots and the Newmans now played by two younger actors yeah. to, to, um, a next level. To, make, to make the future of the yeah. feud that had existed between, you know, Eric Braden and Peter Bergman. So um, I was very proud of, of that story. And is that, uh, what, um, is that what you won an Emmy for on that show? Yeah, it was one of them. It's also one that, you know, a lot of the actors won. Billy Miller won and, and uh, you know, a lot of nominations. It's high stakes. That's what makes. Like Emmy. the Eden Rape. Everybody won for that. I mean, that, right. I mean, th those moments have to be, you, you must be proud of when it when just works. Cause I mean, like I said to you backstage, I mean, no EP comes into a show wanting to to hurt the show. Your your no. goal is to succeed and make it thrive. Yeah, um, no, never, never. I mean, my goal with with uh, um, with Young and the Restless was to take a show that has since become what it was before I got there. And so clearly, when they said put you know to turn it into the twenty first century, um, they didn't really mean that. And I also, at that point in my career, was very stubborn and you know, thought I knew, um, you know, what would be best for it. And of course, nobody knows anything really. Um, but I had a hard time, you know, I mean, my ego got in the way. Um, mm. Would and, you say uh, that was the hardest sh show to work at for you? No, no. One Life was the hardest show to work at for me because, um I mean, there were wonderful things about it, but in turn, it, 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 it happened at a time in my life that was difficult, personal life. And mm -hmm. also, this was a show that was not waiting for the world's most adorable producer to come in and make things better. 
Um, you know, I made some mistakes in terms of bringing in people that made that cast think I liked the people I brought in better than them. Um, that was not true. It was all part of the shake it up thing. But um, but that was and, that, and that was a tough. Is throw. that the Rappaport? They thought. Yeah. Is that the rap? Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, uh, I mean, you're uh, never gonna. I mean, the one thing we're never gonna please everybody. No, That's, and oh, the yeah. audience, the audience loved it, but but the and Bob Woods won, uh, got an Emmy nomination for the work he did when I was there, because when the stakes are high and the actors who are really good get to act, you know, I mean, then you get to see what they're made of. Is there a story you you wanted to tell at any of the six shows? I, I didn't ask you this. Um, that that you know that you recall that the networks were just like, no, but you just thought it was going to be fantastic. Probably. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but I, 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 right. Can't. I mean, you, you, you know, I can't even imagine how you keep any of that six shows, you know, um, you know, times 30 cast members, characters. Times 35 I, years. I, right, you know, I, yeah. no, I mean, probably, um, but but uh, you know, I honestly, I'd have to really think about yeah. it. It's like you, you asking me about socially relevant stories. Am I going? I don't know. Agnes Nixon told socially relevant stories. I killed, you know, Maureen Bauer. I don't know. I mean, I just couldn't quite. Well, you, you, think you of it. breast cancer. You Tina's oh, breast for cancer. Sure. For which sure. Was a great, which was a great one, and and you know. Oh, for sure. But I don't think I don't know that I was that that was a groundbreaking. The first time that anyone had done right, it, right, right. although yeah. it's entirely possible, I just don't know. Um, Do you watch any of them today? No, I can't. You, I can't. It's too hard. Is it it's, okay? You know, but I don't I, mean in a bad way. I just mean you know when you've sat in the back of a control room and told people what you think for the last thirty-five years, it's hard to sit at home and go, "Well, that, you know, I love that scene because I would probably have an opinion that I'd want to tell somebody." <laughs> So you'll start, that's talking, the, you'll start talking to the television. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's the truth. I I, I love the media. I During do. your 35 years, were there shows you watched in primetime that you took from? Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm going to age myself, but when I, ver when I started, shows like, and writers like Stephen Bochco and... Um, David Kelly and I mean those Hill Street Blues and LA Law and ER. Um, I mean that was a very big influence uh, on my uh, another world experience. Mm. Um, and uh, you know while I during the pandemic I had an opportunity to watch some really old shows of uh, Saint Elsewhere. And you're probably too young to remember. No, I remember Saint, Saint Elsewhere. Elsewhere. I didn't watch, but I remember. St. Elsewhere was, ha the, the, the thing that St. Elsewhere did for me was influence the way I played music on the shows for the rest of, after it started, because what they had, Dave Grusin wrote the theme, but what they did on St. Elsewhere, which I had never heard anyone do before, was they took that theme and they made it the cues for the music for the show. And in General Hospital, I did this a lot because when you hear that theme, you know how you're supposed to feel. Yeah. You know, if Nadia's theme comes up in the middle of the scene between, you know, two characters that you love and it's the background, it's the music that is playing for the scene, it tells you immediately how you're supposed to feel. It's just, it's, it just happens. And I learned that from watching what they did on St. Elsewhere. I didn't know I was learning that. I just knew that I loved it and I thought it was very clever. And I was a tremendous fan of Stephen Bochco's. And um, I think, you know, that was, he was a very big influence in my mm -hmm. learning. And, and then and you, you mentioned, I assume you like This Is Us. Very much. Are there very other, other primetime today that you... Well, there's a lot of stuff on cable, you know. I mean, it's um, I, I I watch a lot of a lot of HBO and a lot of other things. This is us is the show 
today, I mean, it used to be Grey's Anatomy and, you know, there were a lot of Sh anything Shonda Rhimes did, but um, I think, I, I, I think This Is Us is, um, it's just, a sh you know, in and of itself, such a brilliant show. Brilliant and show. Justin Hartley had just come to The Young and the Restless and had been there for a year. I love Justin Hartley personally as well as an actor. And he's another one that walked into my office and said, I got a pilot. And I was like, well, you can't do it. And he said, no, I, I have a pilot out. And I said, well, I'm not letting you go. <laughs> and, you know, obviously he said to me, no, I think this one's gonna really Was be a good one. Us? Wow. So obviously he did have a pilot out. Good for and him. when he showed me the promo for it, I was like, yeah, no, you have to go. Goodbye. Wow. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, well, before I let you go, um, at Santa Barbara, when you started to win Emmys, tell us what you what you did and what Justin Dees did with his Emmy. Oh, well, <laughs> this, this is what I got from Stephen Bochco. I was watching LA Law one day and there were people around the water cooler and they had just won the Emmy, the like in that week that had just won the Emmy. And so they were having a water cooler scene around the big bottles of water like you used to have. And, uh, um, and then as they left, the camera panned up and revealed the Emmy. <laughs> so I believe that what they did, I mean, I can't take credit for having thought this up. I just thought that's brilliant. So from then on, every, um, every time the show won an Emmy, we hid the Emmy in every set. It was never meant to be seen. Over the years, people got wise to it and looked for it. Every actor, if, he, if the actor, he or she won an Emmy, it was in their set. The show didn't win just the actor who won the Emmy. And when Justin Dees won, which he did year after year after year, and I'd say to him, Justin, you can't make a big deal about the Emmy. Justin, at the end of some scene, walked by and hung his underwear. <laughs> I love that. That is so. just Justin. <laughs> Very much so. Jill, amazing to talk to you. Thank you Thank so much you. for your time and your honesty. Thank um, you. You know, we can all learn from you. You know, you, you, you've done incredible work over the years. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're um, so welcome. Okay. Um, have a great day. And, and you, uh, tell us about your four dogs. You have four dogs. I have four dogs. Johnny, Murphy, Vivi, and Frankie. And, and two my last two question, labs and two spaniels. And your daughter, did she follow in mom's footsteps at all? She did. My daughter is a very successful reality television show producer. I'm very proud of her. Um, she's EPing some show now. Um, uh, I don't know what the name of it is because she just started it, but she d she spent a few seasons on American Idol as a producer, and she's oh, wow. just about and she's going to go back uh, for the second half of of this season. So yeah, Courtney has done very very well, and I'm a very proud mommy. Oh, that's awesome! Thank you so much. Have a great Thank afternoon. You. you you as well. Thank you well, very much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so down below and turn on notifications to get reminded of all upcoming episodes. And I will see you tomorrow with the producing team of As the World Turns. Have a great day.